This lecture is about how the Fourth Amendment applies in extraterritorial and national security contexts. As I hope you recall from earlier, courts have generally separated the Fourth Amendment analysis into two steps. The first is whether there was a search or seizure. A court might find a search, or a seizure, or neither. If there was a search or seizure, then the court proceeds to a second question. Was it reasonable? Under the default rules, a warrant is required, supported by probable cause, and with a particular description. There are quite a few exceptions to the warrant requirement, and we're going to consider a possible exception in this lecture. So far in the course, we focused on how the Fourth Amendment functions inside the United States and applied to ordinary law enforcement investigations. This lecture looks at how the Fourth Amendment's protections apply outside the United States or when it's applied to national security matters. Before turning to the material, I want to emphasize that these are very undeveloped areas of law. Relatively few cases have been litigated and courts have been quite reluctant to address matters of foreign affairs or national security. The law could very well change. I also want to emphasize that these are very controversial areas of law. Many scholars really think the courts have gone astray. With those caveats, I'd like to take the material in two parts. First, we'll explore extraterritoriality. We'll consider how the Fourth Amendment's protections can get watered down or can completely disappear when surveillance targets or data are outside the United States. Second, we'll consider how flexible the Fourth Amendment is when the government is operating to protect national security or conduct foreign intelligence. So, let's get started with extraterritoriality. The way most lawyers in this field think about extraterritoriality seems to be a two-by-two -two grid. One axis maps the surveillance target's relationship with the United States. The target might be a U.S. person, or might not be. Without going into detail, a U.S. person is roughly a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. All right, so that's one axis. The other axis is the place where the surveillance target is located and where the search or seizure occurs. The government might be operating inside the United States or extraterritorially. For now, assume that the surveillance target is geographically located in the same place where the surveillance occurs. We're going to challenge that assumption soon. Okay. Let's get started with the easiest two categories, where the target and the surveillance are both inside the United States. Those are the fact patterns we've seen so far in the course, and all the ordinary Fourth Amendment protections apply. If you're a foreign citizen traveling in the United States, and the government snoops on you within the United States, you're protected just like an American citizen. All right. So those two categories were pretty easy. Now it gets harder. Let's turn to the category of non-U.S. persons who are outside the United States and who are the target of a search or seizure outside the United States. The Supreme Court expressly addressed this fact pattern in the leading case of United States against Verdugo or Quides, with apologies for my pronunciation. Here are the facts of the case. The leader of a drug cartel was arrested in Mexico and extradited to the United States. While he was incarcerated, before his trial, DEA agents conducted a warrantless search of his residence in Mexico. He moved to suppress the evidence from that search as a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Both the District Court and the Court of Appeals would have applied the Fourth Amendment and suppressed the evidence. A majority of the Supreme Court disagreed and it held that the search was not covered by the Fourth Amendment. It applied a new Fourth Amendment test, which is usually called the Substantial Connection Test. Here's the operative language from the opinion. Aliens, that is, foreigners, not the extraterrestrial kind, receive constitutional protections when they have come within the territory of the United States and developed substantial connections with this country. Let me make three quick points about this test. 
First, it's pretty ambiguous. What counts as a substantial connection? The Supreme Court really didn't give much guidance. Second, courts have really struggled to apply the substantial connection test, especially for individuals who have unlawfully entered the United States. Finally, a few courts are of the view that the substantial connection test isn't binding. That's because the Supreme Court was sharply divided, and arguably, Justice Kennedy's swing vote did not adopt the test. Most courts do treat the test as binding, though. Okay, so there's the substantial connection test. Let me integrate it into our diagram of the Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court emphasized that the Fourth Amendment applies to the people, and it vindicated that language by adding a new step. Before getting to whether there was a search or a seizure, and before getting to reasonableness, you now have to ask, is this person protected by the Fourth Amendment? The answer is yes, if the person has a substantial connection to the United States, whatever that means. And the answer is no, if the person has no substantial connection. So that's how Verdugo Orquidez changed the Fourth Amendment. Let's go back to our two-by-two two grid, since we now have an answer for non-U.S. persons who are outside the United States and are the target of a search or seizure outside the United States. In those cases, there generally isn't a substantial connection to the United States, so there's no Fourth Amendment protection. Let me repeat that, because it's so important. If you're a foreigner outside the United States, and an American officer does something to you outside the United States, then you cannot invoke the Fourth Amendment. Okay, now let's turn to the final category in our grid. U.S. persons who are traveling outside the United States and are the target of a search or seizure outside the United States. In these cases, the Fourth Amendment still applies that's long been the understanding among courts. In fact, in the Verdugo or Quides case, Justice Brennan made a point of this very issue. He expressly noted that every court of appeals to consider the issue has held that the Fourth Amendment protects U.S. persons outside the United States. And he expressly noted that the majority opinion in no way altered that protection. However, and this is a huge however, the substantive Fourth Amendment protections are different. Since this is a tricky doctrine, let me explain what I mean with our familiar diagram. Here's how the analysis goes. When a U.S. person outside the United States is the target of a search or seizure outside the United States. On the first question, is this person protected? The answer is yes. A U.S. person certainly has a substantial connection to the United States. No surprise there. On the next question, whether there was a search or seizure. Well, I told you there was a search or seizure. And if I hadn't told you, you would use the ordinary tests for a search or a seizure. So to recap, on the first two questions, the answers are the exact same as if this had all been in the United States. It's the last question where the doctrine changes. Instead of using the default warrant rules, these cases are governed by a special doctrine. The way courts pose the question is this. When is an extraterritorial search or seizure targeting an extraterritorial U.S. person reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. One approach is to just apply a vague general reasonableness test, balancing government interests and privacy interests. Two appellate courts have taken that approach, and it's certainly the direction favored by the executive branch. The reasoning emphasizes that American courts traditionally haven't issued overseas warrants, and those warrants would be of questionable legal force. Now, in the abstract, saying that a search or a seizure must be reasonable tells us very little. 
That's right in the text of the Fourth Amendment, after all. Very roughly, what the courts have said is that there's an exception to the warrant requirement, but probable cause-ish is still required. I say ish because it's not quite clear if this is the ordinary version of probable cause. The view of the Department of Justice has been that this is a lesser privacy protection, and it's more deferential to the executive branch. Okay, so that's one approach. The other approach is to just piggyback United States law on foreign law. A foreign search or seizure is reasonable if it seems to be in compliance with foreign law. Before he was on the Supreme Court, Justice Kennedy adopted this view for the Ninth Circuit. It's not clear whether the approach applies in general or just to joint investigations with foreign law enforcement. Okay, so those are the two approaches to assessing whether an extraterritorial search or seizure targeting an extraterritorial U.S. person is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Let's return to our two-by-two two grid. As we just saw, in the final cell, there's some Fourth Amendment protection, and there are two differing approaches to that protection. So, that completes the picture for when the target and the search or seizure are geographically in the same place. Now let's add yet another wrinkle. And that is, with information technology, the target person and the data can be in different places. There are a bunch of possible ways in which the law could apply when the person and the data are in different places. The law could be that constitutional protections follow the person, or that they follow the data. Or the law might be that the most protective view trumps, or the least protective view trumps. While I've heard legal scholars argue all of these positions, I want to give my best assessment of where the courts are. And that's more complicated. So, to better reflect where the law is, here's a more precise grid. On one axis is the location of the search or seizure. That's where the data gets collected. On the other axis is the location of the target person. Either of these could be inside the United States or could be outside the United States. As recap, let's start with the fact patterns we just dealt with. If both the data and the target are inside the United States, then the ordinary Fourth Amendment rules apply. A person's citizenship is irrelevant. Let's look at the other fact patterns we dealt with where both the data and the person are outside the United States. As we saw, U.S. persons get some form of reasonableness protection, and non-U.S. persons get no protection. So, those two cells are what we've already covered. Now let's turn to cases where the data is inside the United States, but the target person is outside the United States. In those cases, a U.S. person gets ordinary Fourth Amendment protection. Imagine an American citizen is traveling outside the country on vacation. If the police want to search that person's home inside the United States, courts have long required a warrant. I'm not aware of any court that's taken the position that when a citizen exits the United States, they eliminate their Fourth Amendment protection for their property that remains in the United States. Even the executive branch hasn't much challenged this view. Now let's turn to non-U.S. persons who are located outside the United States and have some data searched or seized inside the United States. The view of the FISA court and of the executive branch is that there is no protection in these scenarios. They seem to just apply Verdugo or Quidas, and they conclude that moving data through the United States or storing data in the United States, is just not enough for a substantial contact. There is especially little case law on this issue, so I've noted it with an asterisk. Now on to the final cell, where the person is inside the United States, but the data is outside the United States. The position of the Department of Justice is that a U.S. person 
gets that vague reasonableness protection. It argued that position in the Silk Road case, for instance. The logic of the purely extraterritorial search and seizure cases would seem to apply. And I think it's fairly likely this is where a court would come out. I've thrown on an asterisk since, once again, there is especially little case law. Our final category is where a foreigner is visiting the United States and that person's data is searched outside the United States. Arguably, Verdugo or Quides addressed this scenario since the drug kingpin in that case had been extradited to the United States at the time of the search. So I think the law is likely that there's no protection here, though there really hasn't been case law development. You could imagine a constitutional difference between voluntarily entering the United States and entering under arrest. So there's the complete picture, such as it is. That was a ton of law, so let me try to distill it. And remember that this is very unsettled. For U.S. persons, under the Fourth Amendment, the level of protection follows the data. When data is inside the United States, the ordinary protections apply. When data is outside the United States, some form of reasonableness applies. It might be that warrants aren't required, and the probable cause standard is a little relaxed. Or it might be that the government has to comply with foreign law. For non-U.S. persons, under the Fourth Amendment, protection requires both the person and the data. If both are inside the United States, then the ordinary protections apply. However, if either is outside the United States, then there is no protection. That means the majority of people on the planet and the majority of data that's generated are not protected by the Fourth Amendment. So, it's easy to see why this area of law is so controversial, especially because of the global internet. Now, what happens if the government makes a mistake and gives someone less protection than they're entitled to? For example, what if the government surveils someone who does have Fourth Amendment protection, but the government believes that they don't have protection? One view, which seems to have been adopted by at least one FISA court judge, is that the government has to immediately destroy the data. If the government afforded too little protection, it can't benefit from that. Another view, at times articulated by the executive branch and some scholars, is that some reasonable mistakes are okay. If the government made a decent attempt at locating a person or data and just happened to get it wrong, that's permissible. Another difficulty I want to touch on is, what if the government incidentally collects data? For example, what if the government surveils someone without Fourth Amendment protection, knowing they'll communicate with someone who is protected? One view, argued by the executive branch and seemingly adopted by the FISA court, is that the target is all that matters. It's the constitutional level of protection that the target receives that determines whether surveillance is permissible. An alternate view, argued by quite a few scholars, is that incidental collection does matter. If the government knows it's going to gather conversations involving protected individuals, it should have to respect those protections. The risk otherwise is that because so much data is international, allowing incidental collection would nullify the Fourth Amendment's protections. The last challenge I'd like to note is, what if data is searched in a location other than where it was seized? For example, if the NSA intercepts some communications outside the United States, then brings those communications back to the United States for analysis, what's the appropriate Fourth Amendment status? Unsurprisingly, the executive branch has taken the position that it's the location of the seizure that matters. That allows for foreign information gathering 
than domestic analysis under more lax constitutional protections. The structure of FISA, I would note, also calibrates protection based on the location of the seizure. Another view, emphasized by some scholars, is that the location of the search also matters. If the government brings data into the United States, then eventually some protections should apply. The very final point I'd like to make on this area of law is just a reminder that Congress can provide greater protection. In particular, ECPA and FISA cover all data in the U.S., even if it belongs to non-U.S. persons outside the U.S. As we've already seen, ECPA provides quite substantial protections, and as we'll soon see, FISA less so. All right, so that brings to a close the material on extraterritoriality, how the Fourth Amendment changes when people or data are outside the United States. Let's turn to the second topic, national security and the Fourth Amendment. And the big legal question is, is there some sort of national security or foreign intelligence exception to the Fourth Amendment's ordinary protections? Using our diagram of the Fourth Amendment, these are cases where the person is protected and there has been a search or seizure, and ordinarily the warrant protections would apply. The government, however, argues that a lesser, general, reasonableness test should apply. In a footnote in the Katz case, the Supreme Court expressly reserved the Fourth Amendment framework for national security investigations. The next Supreme Court case to address the issue was United States against United States District Court. Don't worry about the unusual case name. It has to do with a quirk of appellate procedure. Usually this is just called the Keith case, for short, named after the district court judge. In the Keith case, federal agents warrantlessly wiretapped members of a radical domestic organization. The case was extraordinarily contentious, and in fact, President Nixon's own solicitor general refused to argue the case at the Supreme Court because he thought the government's conduct was plainly unconstitutional. The Supreme Court held unanimously that there is no domestic security exception to the Fourth Amendment's protections. The justices particularly emphasized how slippery the notion of domestic security is, as well as the free speech risks of targeting individuals based on their political beliefs. However, once again, the court expressly reserved how to address national security matters involving foreign powers. That's all the guidance the Supreme Court has provided, so far. In the years following Keith, the Third, Fourth, Fifth, and Ninth Circuits all found a national security exception. Those cases arose from warrantless surveillance before FISA was enacted. More recently, in 2008, the FISA Court of Review also held that there is a national security exception to the Fourth Amendment's ordinary protections. Lower courts are now considering the issue again in the context of incidental warrantless surveillance under Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. I think it's fair to call this the majority view, though it's come under exceptional criticism. Now, there is one appellate court that declined to craft a national security exception. The opinion from the D.C. Circuit was just a plurality, though, arguably dicta, and a subsequent opinion in the same circuit appeared to disagree. So again, the majority view for now is that there is a national security exception. A closely related challenge that I want to note is just how much must national security motivate surveillance to qualify for the exception? There's roughly a spectrum of views. At one end, national security has to be the sole purpose for surveillance. If there's any law enforcement involvement, then the exception is unavailable. In the middle is the notion that surveillance has to be 
primarily motivated by national security to qualify for the exception. The Fourth Circuit adopted that view, and it's been reflected in parts of FISA. Finally, at the far end, national security just has to be a significant purpose for the surveillance. The primary purpose could be law enforcement. That's the view that the FISA Court of Review adopted, and it's also suggested by revisions to FISA. So, there's the potential national security exception to the ordinary protections of the Fourth Amendment. Let me briefly recap. In future, when you approach Fourth Amendment issues, make sure to think about extraterritoriality. Foreigners and their data generally do not receive Fourth Amendment protection. And when Americans travel or send data outside the United States, they get some flavor of reasonableness protection. Also, make sure to think about national security. If surveillance is conducted for that purpose, it likely does not require a warrant, and it gets some lesser reasonableness protection. The next lecture covers the basics of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA. It's a comprehensive federal statutory scheme that addresses surveillance for intelligence purposes.